Thank you, Bob, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's it's always a pleasure to be in Salt Lake, as Philip says. It kind of feels like a nexus for me, though, the uh, the place of my birth. Though it's premature to uh, think of it as the place of my death. I think, <laughs> <laughs> at least I hope. <clears throat> so I thought I would. I was enjoying to talk about the the making of this book of the selected letters, which I think uh, provides a kind of biography in, in its way of, of my father. Uh, it was Jim Hepworth, who's out there in the audience somewhere, uh, who first suggested to me that some eight or ten years ago, I think, that I put together a collection of my father's letters and, and tried to interest a publisher in publishing them. And I regarded that idea with about the, the same level of enthusiasm as, as the atheist who answers his doorbell and encounters a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> I, but Hepworth insisted, your father is a fantastic letter writer, he said. And I said, well, so why don't you do it? <clears throat> And he said, well, if you're not going to, I will. And uh, that was kind of the end of it for uh, several years until uh, one summer I was at our place in Vermont. And my good friend and neighbor, Phil Gray, uh, Jr., the, the son of Philip Gray of Crossing to Safety, I guess. Oh, that's me. That's disconcerting. <laughs> I just... I wondered who this man was that kept moving around. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, he stopped by and he said, look what just turned up in, uh, in, in the attic up at the Eyrie. And it was a, a folder of letters, almost 100 of them, from my father to his father, spanning a period of nearly 40 years. <clears throat> and since Phil Gray Sr. and his wife Peg had, had been my parents' closest lifelong friends, and been practically surrogate parents to me, I was naturally curious. So I borrowed the file and spent the better part of every afternoon for the next week reading through them, uh, probably expecting you know, the usual chit chat and local weather reports and, and gossip about mutual friends, but, but getting instead literary narratives that were an odd mixture of the witty and the profound and the deeply engaged, but always with an emphasis on the word literary. These were not 1940, 1940s versions of email. They were carefully crafted uh, works of epistolatory art, if you will. And I thought, wow, um, Jim Hepworth was right. I hope he's taken up his own suggestion. <clears throat> Then in the following spring, uh, my mother moved into an assisted living facility in, in Portola Valley, California. And my wife and I were engaged in cleaning out a lot of stuff that had gathered in drawers and closets over 50 years of living in the same house in Los Altos Hills. And during this process, uh, Joanne Rogers, who is here tonight, or today, this morning, too, uh, and who had been my father's sort of amanuensis before his death and, and my mother's complete salvation uh, over the seven or eight years that she lived alone in, in the house. Uh, Joanne handed Lynn a binder full of letters that my mother had hidden away, uh, love letters written to her in the early 30s by my father. <laughs> And uh, when he was, uh, he was finishing his degree at Iowa and teaching at uh, Augustana College, I guess it was, in Rock Island, Illinois. <clears throat> and Joanne said, don't you dare tell Mary I gave you these, uh, but you should have them, because if she knew that, were, that they were around, she would destroy them. Uh, well, I can, she would not have destroyed them on, on account of their salacious content, I can assure you. Uh, <laughs> they were pretty tame in that regard, uh, and, and a number of them are in this collection. But, uh, uh, 
But like the letters to Phil and Peg Gray, they were, they were literary gems. They were funny, uh, whimsical, you know, revealing a kind of clownish side to my old man that, uh, as I said, I certainly didn't experience when I was growing up. Um, anyway, the confluence of these letters with the ones from the previous summer made me rethink my original diffidence. And, and the next time Jim and I talked, I told him of this great stash of correspondence and, and asked him if he was, in fact, undertaking the collected letters uh, of Wallace Degner. And if so, did he want them? And he, I sort of, maybe I'm making this up, Jim, but it's, you know, I gotta have a narrative. It's, it's, it's close to what actually happened. He said that, that he, uh, he had done some work, but there were many things on his plate, including full-time teaching, and then he insisted once again that I was the, the one to be doing it, and, the, and that if it were left to him, it would never get done, and so on and so forth, all of which was not true, but in the end, I accepted his deferral. So that's how the book, The Selected Letters of Wallace Degner came to pass. How the original letters came to pass uh, is another story. Uh, it was my father's lifelong habit to work in the mornings. Uh, he would disappear into his study, which was always separate from the house a little before eight, and he would re remain there uninterrupted until 12.30 or one. <clears throat> My mother uh, served as a yeoman warder, uh, so to speak, safeguarding the crown jewel. Um, but anybody passing near that sanctuary could hear the incessant clacking of the keys, uh, interrupted periodically by the scratch of a match and the relighting of a cigar. Uh, and he always began his work day, he said, by writing letters. Warming up the fingers, he called it. Uh, actually, all four of them, because uh, although, although Philip has said he typed with two fingers, in some bizarre manner, he actually typed with four. I don't know how he did that, but anyway. Uh, so he warmed up his fingers. Um, but. But this was clearly not mere, merely a manual dexterity exercise. It was a way to get the, the juices flowing <clears throat> and the mind focused on composition. Because as I remarked earlier, uh, and in my introduction to the volume, this volume uh, that was eventually made of all this finger warming, uh, these letters were not just notes dashed off in the rapid-fire shorthand fashion of today's email, nor were they business affairs with or obligatory howdy-do's with a smidgen of perfunctory chit-chat. These were thoughtful, often ruminative, incredibly articulate, and carefully crafted exchanges with attention to such picayune minutia as spelling and syntax and punctuation all those lost arts. <clears throat> they employed simile, metaphor, poetic imagery, deliberation of voice, and above all, attention to language. In short, they were literary compositions. And far from a mere warming up of the fingers, he was putting the bellows to the fire of his imagination. What impressed me when I was trying to choose from among hundreds of these letters was how attentive my father was to the sound of written expression, even in the most casual of forms. Somehow he put me in mind of the, the company accountant and Marlo, that Marlowe encounters in the, in the outer station on the Congo River in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, you know, that man who in the midst of the most squalid chaos goes around attired always in immaculate dress whites always maintaining an impeccable appearance. So it seems for my father that a letter was no less deserving of, of spats and a waistcoat than the most rhapsodic of passages in Angle of Repose or Beyond the Hundredth Meridian or Wolf Willow. I suppose the question most <coughs> frequently asked me about the selected letters is, 
is what, if anything, I learned about my father that I didn't know in putting together this collection. The questioner hopes, I suppose, that some skeleton perhaps came rattling out of the closet and, and voila, I found out that Vardis Fisher was my father, not Wallace Stegner. <laughs> <coughs> or, <laughs> or that the cackling heard late at night in the, in the attic, remote attic room on the fourth floor was my demented hydrocephalic sister who was being <laughs> locked up for life for having set fire to the, the pages of my father's latest novel. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint, um, though I will speak uh, to what I learned from this, from the perusal of, of this monumental correspondence. But uh, first, let me sit, say a, a, a few words about process. Uh, my father didn't, for the most part, keep carbon copies of his correspondence. So the great preponderance of it was just out there with the recipient or the, the recipient's heirs or the repository of the recipient's papers. If I was lucky, that repository was a library. And if I was unlucky, it was a wastebasket. But the question was, what, what recipient, what library, uh, and how do, I, how do I find them? And this, I suppose, is where Jim Hepworth was at least partially right when he kept arguing that I was the guy to undertake this task. Because to a considerable extent, I knew who my father knew, so it was simply a matter of writing a letter or, uh, or going online and finding out where uh, so-and-so had left his or her papers and then writing an email, God forbid, uh, to the special collections librarian at the Beinecke or the, or the Regenstein or the Bancroft or the Widener or, or the Huntington or wherever and asking if they had any letters from Wallace Stegner in the, in the Frost papers or the Malcolm Cowley papers or the Catherine Ann Porter papers, Ansel Adams archives. <clears throat> now librarians, I have learned over the years are, are a wonderful lot. And there's a long list of them cited with gratitude in the acknowledgments in this co collection. And I want to make special mention here, incidentally, <coughs> of the Marriott Library here at the University of Utah, uh, where Stegner's own papers are, are, are housed. I could not have done this, this book at all without the help of Greg Thompson and his very, very capable and helpful staff. Well, anyway, not only would these special collections librarians locate the specific references <coughs> I was seeking, in many cases they would read the files and send a precy of the contents, and they would often tell me, uh, by the way, we also have letters from Mr. Stegner to so-and-so or so-and-so, and <coughs> would you like copies of those as well? Well, yes, I would. Thank you very much. And and don't forget to send me the bill for copying, which they almost always never would. <laughs> then <coughs> other scholars who have uh, published books about Stegner, Jack Benson, uh, Richard Echelaine, Forrest Robinson, Jim Hepworth, um, were tremendously helpful, uh, of course, and sent me copies of whatever they had in their files. And then Philip. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Fradgen, Philip was, as you know, working on his recent biography of Stegner at the same time I was searching for letters. And so over a period of a year or two, we fed each other things back and forth that we thought the other might be, find useful. And I think Philip was much more useful to me than I was to him. Gradually, the file cabinet began to fill one drawer, then another, and gradually, out of that, an organizational structure began to emerge from, from the chaos. I had initially assumed by default that the material would be presented chronologically, and that is one read through from the beginning to end a, a, a portrait of the artist as a young man, as a middle-aged man, as an old man would emerge and give the book some kind of function, at least as a kind of literary history. 
But I never liked that chronological approach. I don't really think people read that way if they read letters at all. Or if they do, they soon <coughs> get bored and, and wander away. What began to present itself as the file drawers filled was categories. Uh, letters to family, letters to literary peers, letters relating specifically to the creative writing program at Stanford, letters to do with the writing of history, letters on conservation and wilderness preservation. And that finally was the structure that made the most sense to me. Eventually, I began to look at the filing cabinets and say to myself, you know, this could go on indefinitely. Uh, <laughs> by no means have you exhausted the field uh, for one re thing I hadn't even advertised for letters. And I knew that somewhere there were letters to Frost and Frank O'Connor and, and a lot of more letters to Benny DeVoto uh, than I had find, found. And there were former students uh, that I hadn't contacted, but finally I had to say, hey, enough is enough. Uh, employ the lessons of synecdoche. Consider 400 pages of test pourings probably uh, enough to give you a portrait of the whole man, a better portrait than trying to track down every postcard that he ever scribbled. Uh, so that was it. I stopped just when I stopped. Novelists have few of the usual excuses for writing their autobiographies. My father once wrote, <clears throat> they're not like politicians and generals. Though they may be just as intent on leaving their mark on the world, they have no obligation to history and no lifetime of top secret action to reveal. And anyway, he went on to say, writers <clears throat> often use up their autobiographical capital in the creation of their fictions. Uh, disbursement he clearly felt applied to himself, <clears throat> to him. So except in a, in a couple of essays like Literary by Accident or Finding the Place, A, a Migrant Childhood, and, and, the, and the memoir uh, portion of Wolf Willow, these selected letters I think are as close as we're ever going to get to personal history, to, to thoughts, opinions, positions that have not been transformed by the imagination and by literary conjury. <clears throat> In some, I think they are a pretty good portrait of the whole man. I mentioned a little earlier that one of the questions I'm most frequently asked in regard to this whole task of editing one's parents' personal and often intimate expressions <clears throat> is did I learn anything that I didn't know? To which I would say, I think I learned things that I didn't, didn't know I knew or, or had forgotten I knew. Because this could be one of those, uh, when did he know what he knew and when did he know he knew it, but <laughs> games. But, uh, One of the things that I that I was that I relearned was that that he could be very very funny. Uh, something that it was sometimes easy for me to overlook, since during my most impressionable years, when I was doing my best to fail to grow up, humor was not the focal point of our <laughs> relations. <laughs> but that that was a minor revelation. <clears throat> I remember a year or so ago when John Howe was doing that, shooting that KUED documentary that uh, has been recently shown here in Salt Lake. He was interviewing me and <clears throat> the camera started rolling and the lights were in my face. The boom mic was over my head and he asked me, uh, what was Wallace Stegner like as a father? Which is an impossibly complicated question. <laughs> That my, and my mind simply seized up like an engine without oil, and all I could do was blurt out, well, he, he, he was nice. <laughs> Mercifully, they edited that out of the film. 
<clears throat> well, he was nice, but I never really uh, had focused on how nice or in what way nice. Collecting his letters put me in confrontation with that quality all of the time. And I'll give you some examples. Um, take this letter to Miss Susan Parkman in May of 1956. Dear Susan, the question that you have been debating in your class is one of a kind that better heads than any of ours have failed to settle. I suspect that both sides are partially right. In fact, I know they are. You and your classmates are right in assuming that I was writing about things I had known and seen when I was a boy in Canada. And your teacher and your textbook are right when I, that I dressed up the facts somewhat. It would take a long time to separate the fiction from the nonfiction in a story like this. But here are some hints. And then he goes on for another nearly two typewritten uh, single uh, pages. Um, doing exactly that. Now what's remarkable about this, I think, is that Susan Parkman is 11 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and, and her class mates, whom he's also indirect, uh, indirectly addressing, are fifth graders in, in Waynesburg, Pennsylvania. And I mean, surely the man has more profitable things to do with his time than that. <laughs> he gives them more time than he, he gives a few days later to Malcolm Cowley, who's trying to <laughs> drum up a, a reading for Kenneth Patchen. Or take this letter to Mar Margaret Kexmitty of Roundup, Montana, in May of 18, 1986. Dear Margaret Kexmitty, it's taken me a month to get around to answering your good, hearty, belly-laughing belly Honecker letter. It was like a wind off the curly grass. You brought me home. Roundup is not so far from the Cypress Hills with the Montana Plains so different from those in Saskatchewan that there's any substantial cultural difference. Even the violin, the only violin I ever had was made out of a cigar box, but I know your cultural aspirations. In fact, I never met anyone, not anyone, who had grown up in short grass country with whom I didn't feel some sort of bond. I might not have liked them all, but I knew we belonged to the same tribe. We recognized the same things. One of the things I recognize most commonly is that same cultural hunger. <clears throat> growing up in deprivation like that must be sort of like growing up in Siberia. The whole world, any part of it, looks exciting. And all of human accomplishment has to be realized by hand in a single lifetime. I wish Roundup were a little closer. We ought to be paying visits back and forth. For lack of that pleasure, this note will have to serve. It is to say mainly how much your letter delighted me. Well, in point of fact, a little essay on cultural deprivation says a great deal more than just how much Mrs. Kexmetti's letter delighted him, which inspires me again to belabor the point. He didn't know Mrs. Kexmetti from Lady Astor. She was just a reader out there in the boondocks of central Montana who wrote him a fan letter, and to whom he could have just written back a note to say how much her fanship delighted him, or he could have just sighed the heavy sigh of burdened celebrity and ignored it. I mean, how many book sales are there out there in Roundup, Montana? <clears throat> but, but he didn't. Um, and it would have been unthinkable for him to short, never mind disregard, somebody who was touched by his work. <clears throat> and it didn't matter whether that person was a ranch wife in Montana or a fifth grader in Pennsylvania. He, was all, he always gave thoughtful and respectful attention. The number of his correspondence was enormous and, and included a heavy load of famous and important people. A great many of them represented in the selected letters, the Ansel Adamses, the Stuart Udalls, the David Packards, the Wendell Berries, the Gary Snyders, the David Browers, and so on and on. But none of them were more important than Susan Parkman and Margaret Kexmetti. 
And that is the one big thing that really began to impress itself upon me during the course of this work. I came away from it with a much clearer, perhaps because more objectified, <clears throat> image of a man of enormous wisdom and humility, a man with a profound sense of responsibility, not only to his own accidental gifts, his own peculiar sensitivities and sensibilities, but to the natural and the human community of which he was a part. When I have the wit to think about it, he once wrote, I'm terribly proud to be a man and an American with all the rights and privileges that those words connote. And most of all, I'm humble before the responsibilities <coughs> that are also mine. For no right comes without a responsibility. And being born luckier than most of the world's millions I am also born more, more obligated. <clears throat> now that sounds very noble and grand, like something that a person would say on that old Edward R. Murrow radio program, this I believe, uh, which is in fact exactly where it was uttered. But the proof is in the pudding, and it is my contention that the unalloyed pudding is the life revealed through the letters, the life unfiltered by the imagination and subsequently reproduced in story. <clears throat> Barry Lopez once told me that the first time he met my father, <clears throat> what struck him most profoundly was the uncondescending generosity of his attention. And the way he made Barry feel as if, he said, we stood on the same floor together. Years later, sitting around Wendell's kitchen in Port Royal, Kentucky, he said, we came around to talking about Stegner. We agreed that he was the only man either one of us knew who could pay you a compliment in such a way that you felt you had to continue and maybe do better just to live up to the implied expectation. Tom Watkins, <coughs> in a tribute he wrote to my fa after my father's death about his first meeting with Wallace Stegner said, I pranced around him like an overgrown and overblown puppy, offering mindless comments on sundry aspects of his work <clears throat> and what I perceived to be the true meaning of literature. <clears throat> and he treated me with attentive respect instead of the disdain I so richly deserved. He nodded sagely in agreement at my judgments, thanked me sincerely for my praise, said kind things about my own Bush League efforts, and encouraged me to commit more of them. If I had not revered him before, I sure did then. And Ed McClanahan, uh, in that same collection of tributes, wrote that Wallace Degner was a masterful writer and a great teacher everybody knows. But for those of us who were blessed to know him personally, I'd venture to say it's his humanity, his dignity, and his generosity that we sorely miss. It's a recurring theme, or I should say it is the recurring theme. He set the example of how a writer should conduct himself, as Barry Lopez said. In our era of celebrity, he would, have had, he would have none of it. In an era of self-promotion, he just walked away. In an era of obsession with personal goals, he wanted to know how he could help the community. If any overarching sentiment pervades these letters, this is it. Help the community, <clears throat> the community of writers, the community of wilderness preservationists, the community of man. I could open the, the book at random and, and almost anything I might choose to read would serve to corroborate uh, that, that, that assertion. But let me, let me leave you instead with a, a single uh, rather notorious example. This being a letter to Susan Houston at the National Endowment for the Arts in May of 1992. Dear Miss Houston, he writes, 
your telephone call telling me that the president, that President Bush has selected me among those to receive the National Medal for the Arts has put me in a quandary. Until recently, I would have received the news with pride and gratification, but I have been distressed by what has been done to the endowment for the arts by its congressional and administrative enemies who first forced it to require a humiliating decency oath from its grantees, then fired director John Frohmeyer and subverted his reasonable policies, and finally appointed in his place a censor with veto power over decisions of the staff and council. <clears throat> I believe very strongly in government support for the arts. Believe in fact that a government does not, that does not support the arts harms both itself and the nation. I also believe that support is meaningless, even harmful, if it restricts the imaginative freedom of those to whom it is given. By definition, creation breaks new ground. And to break new ground must take risks and make mistakes. It was only by taking risks that the human species, as Lewis Thomas said, blundered into brains. <clears throat> the supporting agency must allow for that risk taking and so must take risks itself. That was the old honorable philosophy of the endowment and I trust it is still the faith of many of its officers and employees, though they are enjoined against it. So though I am grateful to people in the endowment for nominating me, I am troubled by the political controls placed on the agency. Though they do not seem to be applied to me, I feel that I must protest them, for some artists would feel lobotomized by them, and the pre precedent of censorship is demoralizing. Therefore, I must regretfully decline the honor that is offered me. I shall not be there on July 21st. Sincerely, Wallace Stegner. There are, I don't know what our time is like. We have five minutes. If, if there are questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. I don't, yes. Beyond that, what one inherits and that you have inherited obviously from your father, how did you develop your writing skills? Did you sit at his feet and <laughs> learn or no. go to his class or how did you do it? I, I avoided uh, everything to do with writing. I managed to get through four years of college without taking a single English course. <laughs> and then I, con then I gave up. I conceded that the only thing I had any gift for was words. And I wasn't good at anything else. So I, and I drifted into the, the academic and world. And, I found myself in Columbus, Ohio, teaching at Ohio State, which at the time I, I was uncharitable in my opinion of, not the university, but Columbus, Ohio, which I, being a Western boy found a little flat. <laughs> and in a kind of funk, I decided I, I was thinking about a, a trip I had made down to Big, Big Sur with my two-year-old, three-year-old son. And I just started writing a piece of fiction about it. And that was the end of me. Uh, it went on from there and I, uh, and I thought, well, you know, I think I'll try, I'll send this to my old man and see what, maybe, you know, maybe I'll get some approval from him for something, something, finally. <laughs> so I sent it to him and uh, to my astonishment, I learned later, he took it to the to the writing uh, workshop, and for all I know, Wendell Berry was sitting there, and and I was in it. It was, it was he didn't say whose piece it was. He used to write. He he read every uh, he read the workshop uh, pieces himself without identifying the authors, so that <clears throat> people were chopping up the pieces. They wouldn't be chopping up one another. And he just inserted mine without telling anybody. And then 
So that was kind of neat. And that's, I don't know if I answered your question. I rambled off the point, but anyway. I didn't start out to do it. Yes? You know, of course, we all have flaws. And I'm just curious of what your perspective is on how your father allowed himself to stub his toe on the inclusion of the woman's letters in Angle of Repose. Well, I don't think, I don't agree uh, with the, th I mean, I, I, perhaps I'm defensive, but I don't, I don't think he didn't plagiarize. In first place, if, again, all the letters are here that he wrote to the family members saying exactly what he was going to do. Uh, that he was going to use passages of her work verbatim and, and so on and so forth, that he was not writing a, a, bio, a what, is it, what is it called, a Romain, a clef, or what, when you write, a, what's the word for a, a novel that is about somebody's life? Is that the right word? Yes, yes okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, that, that this wasn't, a, you know, about Mary Halleck Foote, it was using blah, 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 blah. And would they be, please read the manuscript before it was submitted, <clears throat> no need, they said. All that is accounted for. And Philip has accounted for it in, at length in the biography, as, as has Jackson Benson. Um, so I guess, you, you know, it may be more retrospective stubbing of the, of the toe than, you know, than just accidental because it, it really wasn't accidental. It was deliberate and with their approval. That doesn't make it right for a lot of people, but that's all. Yeah. Any other? Yes. You mentioned that your father had a violin made from a cigar box. <laughs> Apparently. <mentioned> <laughs> yes, and you also said he was attentive to the sound of rhythmic expression, which is something that I've noticed. I'm a music historian. Um, can you talk about your father's interest in music or anything you know about his relationship to music? Well, he was a great... Uh, he loved to sing, and he uh, sang a lot of songs, which he learned from his father, who was also a great uh, singer of, of ballads and songs. Unfortunately, he had no, uh, he, he played no instrument because he was missing a finger on his, uh, the ring finger on his left hand. Uh, he lost in, a, <clears throat> in an accident here in Salt Lake. Variously, I mean, he never told the same story about it tw <laughs> twice, so I don't really know how he lost it. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I won't, I won't bore you with all the versions of where it went, but <laughs> so he couldn't, he couldn't play a guitar or anything. He didn't have the fingers to fret it, <laughs> but he loved music and uh, and loved to sing. And he would he 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 liked to call square dances. He was a good caller, and he liked to square dance. So. Uh, that's about all I know about it. Yeah. What has, what has become of the family properties? Home in California. And the, studio? the home in California was sold. Uh, what, three or four years ago, I guess. Huh? My mother lived in it alone for <coughs> seven or eight years, I guess, before she finally <coughs> fell and broke her hip and, you know, the slippery slope that unfortunately happens to, to folks when they get into their 90s. And so um, she, and also during all that time that she was in it, uh, deferred maintenance does not begin to describe what had happened to the house. Um, so uh, we we really had no choice but to sell it, and so it uh, angered a lot of people in Los Altos. They thought it should become a shrine, or that the, we tried to suggest that maybe the university Stanford would like to acquire it. And, 
and uh, use it as a writing center or you know anything. And they thought that would be fine, but they wanted us to give it to them since it was, a, if you know anything about property values in Los Altos Hills, that was a, more of a gift to Stanford than I was inclined to make. <laughs> Okay, I see a sign here that says stop and I will leave you with that.